Welcome to Plus One Forward, the podcast powered by the apocalypse, where we talk about tabletop role-playing games using or inspired by the apocalypse engine. I'm your MC, Rich, and I'm joined by my guest, Mark Plemons of Bravel Mark Press. Hey, Mark, welcome to the show. Hey, Rich, it's great to be here. Fantastic. It's exciting. It's the first time we've talked, so I'm, I'm happy to have you on the show. Yeah, I've heard you on uh, The Gauntlet and, of course, on this show, but we've never actually met. I know, I know. We're going to have to fix that. All right, well, let's kick this off in normal style. How long have you been playing PBTA games, and what was your gateway? Uh, it's only been a couple years for me. I came at PBTA in, in kind of a weird way. Uh, it was like early 2015, and I've been publishing RPGs since one. But I wasn't really familiar with the indie scene. I was more of a traditional guy because I was in traditional publishing. And I knew it existed. I knew about Fate. I even I knew about Fudge back in the day. Oh, wow. Okay. But, it, you know, I didn't know what Apocalypse World was. And somehow, I probably Kickstarter, I heard of Night Witches. Nice. And nice one to kick into. Yeah, That's cool. I thought the theme was, was really cool. You know, Russian air women in World War II. And I put it on my drive through RPG wish list, and it sat there for a while. And finally, I downloaded it. And I was sitting on the couch, reading it on my tablet. The TV's in the background, actually playing MASH, the TV show. And I just had that eureka moment and thought, hey, I, I'm a game designer. I like what I'm reading about this system. That would be really cool for a Korean War MASH RPG. And when I got that idea, I just went down the rabbit hole and I, I read Apocalypse World and like every, I think I've read almost every PBT game that's out there because I just fell in love with the system. I love the mechanics and the moves uh, and the way you can repurpose it to fit all the different genres. I just love the system. It is really flexible. I'm curious though, like what's one that you've gotten to the table recently? Probably the last one that I got a chance to play was the Warren. Nice. Which is, is really fun. I had sort of a a scrappy, scrawny rabbit. I kind of based him off. <laughs> it's silly. I kind of based him off of the gremlin Spike. So <laughs> his name was, it was Spike and he was, he was very, uh, very strong and into digging and, but sort of prone to panicking. <laughs> It sounds it sounds very spikish. That's yeah, good. I like it. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, so let's jump on in and read a sitch, okay? Yeah, read a sitch. Okay, for people who have been listening to Plus One Forward, you know that we had a previous episode, Worldwide Wrestling RPG, where I had Nathan talk about how you would mix in somebody who just drop in and drop out play when there's a complex. HX or relationship or bond system in a lot of PBTA games. But I wanted to pick your brain, Mark, and talk about what about if you have a longer term game and, you know, we have some where you can bring in a second PC and what if you've used up all of your HX or you just don't have any bonds to hand out? What are some ways that you could try to get around that? Well, you know, I have actually, I've not played in one of the PBTA games that has bonds so I'm more familiar with just traditional HX. Sure, sure. Same difference. Sure. With HX, if you're bringing in a new player, I actually would hold off on HX until the next session so you can bring them in and sort of see how they mesh and maybe build the HX on what happens in the first session. But we're talking about plot. We're not talking about HX, right? So Yeah, yeah. For plot, I'm really big into springing surprises on if I can't spring them on the players I like to spring them on the characters so if I was emceeing say a monster hearts game I'd definitely look at stealing from Buffy and maybe see if the players are okay with introducing the new PC as somebody's sister or brother who they didn't know they had like when Dawn came on the show in yeah. season 5 and it's just oh magic 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 Dawn's always just been there and the tv audience is going wtf but you can't really do that with the table you have to actually you know let them in on what's going on so meta knowledge could be tricky now if it was dungeon world if you're trying to go for that classic D D feel you just have someone new show up at the tavern <laughs> and say hey <laughs> hey are you going in a dungeon 
you know that depends on your what kind of feel you're going for for like apocalypse world or or the warren like we said me personally i would and it's something that's really combat heavy like that i would have the new pc sh- just show up like running badass out of hell from something bigger and stumble right into the group yeah i could i could buy that i could totally see that that's cool yeah i mean you you have to go with the assumption that the players have the meta knowledge and they're gonna let the new person in and, instead of just shooting them in the head yes yes well, <laughs> uh, based on the queen rule alone they should not be doing something like that and i think that's a fair assumption to make yeah so you're gonna have a lot have a lot of fun with it that way and then go with what works for the plot and put the hx uh, or the bonds or whatever on hold until next session what about a military style game you know like night witches or the regiment or i, I don't know a game about the korean war you know i was gonna bring that up and somehow i just forgot <laughs> well that's the great great thing with military games uh because your your characters lives aren't in your own hands you're in the army now and new characters can show up and old characters can leave and there's nothing you can really do about it when I think about this question, because I am currently in a slightly longer running game, and I think about, well, what's going to happen if somebody cycles out, new characters come in? And I was listening to The Warren, and one of the things is if there are unique moves to each individual rabbit. And I look at a lot of the HX and Bonds, they're pretty unique, right? And I wouldn't necessarily say that you could always reuse those bonds, but it is something you can keep an eye towards. You know, there are certain HX questions that can be framed to different situations, and it would be interesting to say, you know, I really like this angle. Oh, well, I'm the brainer. Not only did I watch this person while they're sleeping, I've watched this person over here while they're sleeping, too. I mean, why not? I watch them all. They're all sleeping. Look under your chairs. Everyone <laughs> I've watched you sleeping. Uh, So I think there are options to reuse HX questions that you don't have to feel like I only ever did this one thing because these are complicated people that have lives that existed before we came on screen. And sure, we want to play to find out what happens, but we can also imagine that things happened two years ago that could affect someone's history or relationships. So I I think ratcheting it down so you can only use this to be the one player character only ever. Maybe you, you flex out of that and you, you widen that scope a little bit. So, Anyway, anything else that you wanted to talk about uh, for ongoing games and introducing new characters to that plot? No, I think that pretty much covers it. I sadly haven't had a chance to game in a while. I've been too busy with MASH to actually sit down at the table once playtesting was over. All right, well, why don't we talk about MASH? Because I want to hear all about this thing that you've had to dedicate your gaming time to, which I can't personally imagine. Like, <laughs> I would not give up all gaming for one game of any kind, oh, even it's... a PVTA game. I just can't do it. <laughs> oh, it's it's rough. I'm, uh, yeah, I get up like at 5.30 in the morning and I go to work and then I pick my four-year-old daughter up at school and you know, then I take care of her until we go to bed because my wife works in the evenings. Um, and she also works on the weekends. So it, all of my gaming and writing time is like compressed into just like a few hours a week. It's really tough. Cool. Sounds like it. All right. Well, let's open our brain to mash the RPG, okay? Yes. Open your brain. Mark, mashed the Korean War RPG. Now, you understand that most gamers weren't <laughs> alive during the Korean War. And unfortunately, even though you and I might be different, most gamers these days probably haven't seen the MASH TV show. So what's the setting of this game and what's it all about? Sure. You know, I'm really bummed that Netflix took MASH off like months before the game came out. Like while it's I was working fair. on the game, they took it off. So If only you'd had the kismet of another Mark, Mark Richardson, when he was coming out with Headspace and Sense8 was on Netflix. And then Netflix just went and screwed you by taking MASH off. That's a bummer. <laughs> Yeah, he had perfect timing on that. He did. He did. He was like, guys, just kickstart this game that I happen to have coincided with since 8. So anyway, what is MASH the RPG? What's it about? (laughs) Well, if you've seen the movie or the TV show MASH, then you know the general theme. It's about army medics and affiliated personnel who all live and work together 
in a Korean War MASH unit. MASH stands for Mobile Army Surgical Hospital. It's a historical term, technical term. It's not a copyrighted thing. And I did not base the game on the show. Um, I based it on the real history and the very few reference books that are out there about the MASH units. The cool thing, actually, is that the TV show based itself heavily on those same sources. So there is a very similar feel. If you've seen MASH, the movie or the TV show, then you have an immediate idea of what this game is like. So you have a MASH. uh, It's like a football field-sized area just filled with tents and other structures staffed by about two dozen medics and another 80 to 100 enlisted men like engineers and clerks and cooks and so on. And they keep the camp running. But you have a choice of one of seven playbooks. The Angel, which is the nurse. Mm -hmm. The Corman. The Cowboy, which is like a pilot or a mechanic or driver. Uh, The Cutter, which is the surgeon. Uh, Then the Doc, who's a doctor, of course. Um, The Grunt, sort of your average... um, mostly an enlisted man, and then the Padre, of course, the army chaplain. And your job is to try and save the lives of the dying soldiers and civilians and try and find some how to relax and stay sane among all the blood and carnage until you can finally get rotated back home. Cool. I'm curious, which of the playbooks gets a teddy bear? (laughs) I just had to slip that joke in. Sure. Cool. So what mechanics are different in Mashed versus vanilla Apocalypse World? Well, Apocalypse World and you know, a lot of PBTA games, except for, well, I wouldn't say except for a few. There, there are quite a few that look at things other than combat. But when you think of Apocalypse World, you think of post-apocalypse, you think of combat. Um, whereas Mash is really dealing with the aftermath of combat. You are in the army but you're not a soldier on the front lines. You're trying to patch up the wounded and not create more wounded. And so the mechanics are there to reinforce the meatball surgery and the daily grind that you're stuck in. Cool. Okay. What else? MASH is essentially divided up into two phases. You have the camp life scenes, and then you have the medical scenes. So there are basic moves, and there are medical moves. Uh, If you've seen MASH, you know that the camp life, scene, camp life scenes alternate with the operating tent scenes, mm-hmm. and MASH follows that same kind of structure. In the surgical scenes, each patient is represented by a play sheet, which has a human figure and several standard Apocalypse World-style clocks. One on the head, one on the chest, and one on the guts— And those are the primary clocks that represent the vital organs. Then your limbs on this play sheet have smaller secondary clocks on the upper and lower arms and legs and the hands. And each of these clocks represents a wound level. Mm -hmm. The number of filled segments of like, you know, an Apocalypse World harm clock indicates the severity of the wound. So before surgery, the CO takes two or three play sheets fills in segments on I mean you're not filling in every one you might fill he might fill in a couple primary clocks and a couple secondary clocks or Mm -hmm. you know a small number Uh, and the sheet also has three countdown clocks up at the top with eight six and four segments and the CEO will use just one of those depending on how much tension uh, that she or he wants this particular surgery to have Every time the players make a medical move on the patient to try and treat the wound, or just whenever the CO wants to make a hard move or feels really sadistic, then the countdown clock fills up by one segment. Okay. And the the goal is to ensure that all three primary clocks, the head, the chest, and the guts representing the vital organs, all three of those need to be reduced to severity two or less before the countdown clock fills or the patient dies. Tense. It sounds really tense. Yeah, and if there are the secondary limb clocks, if you haven't gotten them down to two, then that body part has to be amputated. 
you're not rolling to amputate. You just say, okay, sad news, but, but that happens. And the CO can even start filling up the next patient's countdown clocks if the players spend a long time on one patient. So they, <laughs> it really forces hard choices and tension. Like, okay, we have to save this patient, but, you know, I, I have like 200 other kids on cots, on tables, in line behind this guy. It tries to represent what really happened in the war. They used to call it par surgery. You're just trying to get par on this patient, like if you're playing golf. You want to get do like absolutely the minimum that you can do to save this kid's life, and then you have to move on because otherwise everybody in line behind him is just going to snowball. And it could be really tense and really hectic, and you know that's the intent of it. Wow. Yeah. Now, there are four medical moves, assist, diagnose, prescribe, and treat. And I'll try to make it quick because it sounds a lot more complicated than it is. Um, but you'll have two, maybe three player medics working on one patient play sheet. And each patient just sort of represents a bunch of patients because you wouldn't want to sit down at the table and have a stack of like 300 <laughs> play sheets because... <laughs> The medics in the Korean War, they would work until they dropped sometimes. They would work, you know, 16, 24 hours, and they would sleep sitting up, and they would have their meals brought to the tent. They just had to keep working uh, until all the patients were gone. And when they had a large push on a hill or an enemy advancement, then you could have dozens and even hundreds of casualties coming in to just one hospital tent. Uh, but if you have two or three player medics on one patient... You've got a cutter, who's your surgeon, using the treat moves to actually operate on the wound clocks. That's the person trying to take that wound severity down. Then there's going to be another player, either an angel or a doc or a corpsman, making the assist moves simultaneously. And those roles get holds that they can use as plus one forward or maybe to eliminate a consequence if a cutter... Uh, has a miss or a seven to nine on their treat roll, then they can cause a potential consequence, which might be speeding up the countdown clock, botching a roll and actually making the harm worse, something like that. Uh, then you could potentially have a third person, either a player or an NPC on this patient, who's just monitoring the anesthesia and regulating it. So if there's a consequence that the assistant can't take care of. The anesthetist or the anesthesiologist can step in and has that one extra chance to try and keep that consequence from making it worse. And of course, if the assistant or the um, anesthesiologist also miss, then they can make it much, much worse. Oh my gosh, that's like three at that point. That's, yeah. Wow. Yeah, so, and then the overall mechanic that drives everything is stress, um, because life in an army unit is stressful, even if you're not on the front lines. So you have a stress track of six boxes, and you take a point of stress whenever you fail certain moves, mostly medical moves, or, you know, when the CO feels like the fiction warrants it, and they want to make a hard move to give it to you. Like, if we go back to where we were talking about bringing players in and taking players out. I think about the TV show MASH when they would take out a character and bring in a new one. When Spoiler here for like a 30, 40 year old TV show. When they kill off Henry Blake, you know, it, Radar comes in and he says, hey, just found out he was on his way home and plane got shot down. And everybody has to keep working. And I would say that would be an eventuality where the CO would make a hard move and say, okay, you, you take a point of stress for that. But when you take stress, you roll to see if you take a condition as well, and there are lists of uh, physical and mental and emotional conditions you can use, or you can pick one of your own. You might be insomniac, or you might feel humiliated by something that happened. You might get dizzy, headaches. So you can pick one of those, and then you make that part of your character ongoing as you play through the fiction. And you can get rid of them um, with the relaxed move, which is the main way 
that you keep your stress down and you try and get rid of your emotional conditions by doing things that are appropriate for your character. And it sort of enforces the need for the hijinks and the craziness to get drunk and to have sex and to pull pranks and to do all kinds of crazy things just to keep yourself sane. I really like that cycle. That that's super cool. Thanks. All right, man, that's that is cool. So what of all of these moves, what's your favorite move and why? <laughs> well, you mentioned uh radar. I and I would say I really like one of the Corman moves called Anticipator. Uh, when you sit down for a session, you roll plus luck. On a 10 or higher, you get you hold 2. And on a 7 to 9, you hold 1. Anytime during the session, you can spend one of those holds to just show up. Like, okay, hey, I'm here. I've got what you need. I've got this clipboard with all the information you need. Or I just I show up and I say, oh, you guys are looking for a, a case of beer? I just saw somebody... I just saw Captain James sneaking into his tent with one. Uh, it's it's a very radar move to just yeah. pop up at someone's shoulder and say, yes, sir, here's that thing you wanted. Very cool. Very cool. Hey, um, I'm curious about this, Mark, and I'm mostly asking this question for my wife. Could this, how hard would it be to reskin this game for something like China Beach, which is a sort of mash unit, but in Vietnam? I don't think it would be too difficult. All of the playbooks and the roles and everything, those are going to be pretty identical to the Vietnam conflict. Other than, you know, seeing a handful of movies, I'm not as familiar with that. I didn't spend like two years researching that war like I did with the Korean sure, War. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I, I'm not going to um, call you on it. But I, I was just wondering, is there anything embedded in there that is specific to Korea. I would imagine the medical technology terminology might be slightly different, but anything this really baked in Korea war era stuff that we would probably need to lift out and think Vietnam conflict. Nothing is jumping out at me for the mechanics. Of course, there's tons of era specific information about the rank structure and chapter six is all about the war and it gives ideas for things you can do in the fiction every at least for every month uh there's multiple ideas for events and threats and all sorts of things scattered through that chapter and then tons of that of course in the the CO's chapter who is your MC I call them the commanding officer the CO nice so some of that stuff is going to be very very specific to the Korean war but for the mechanics the mechanics should be fairly easy to convert to, I would say, World War II or the Vietnam War. Now, if you wanted to do, like, outer space, <laughs> that would be that would require a, a little more work, I think. Yeah. Although, a Babylon 5 version of this would be an interesting experiment. Uh, I love I love B5. I, I don't want to get off too much on a tangent, but... Yeah, I could... <laughs> <laughs> you know, one thing I, I always wanted to do is run a B5 game that spans the entire TV series where your characters are doing something that happens in the background of every episode. Yeah. And then when you're done, you sit down and watch the episode and you you kind of see how your actions influence the main plot. That's really cool. That's the Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead version of Babylon 5 would be cool. Yeah. I'll never do it, oh. but I always wanted to. All right. Well, you've got me really excited uh, about this, Mark. Could, do you think we could act under fire and get mashed underway and let me get a taste of it? Absolutely. It is time to act under fire. We're going to act under fire here. I'm going to be playing uh, a lieutenant, Lieutenant Plussy. I've been serving in the, and in, in we worked on this ahead of time, so I, I think I'm good here saying I'm serving in the 8099th. What the hell? I wouldn't say 8099, so I would say 8099th. <laughs> Is that what I'd say? That's right. Cool. Uh, for a that's, couple months. Yeah, that's my, my sample mash unit is the 8099th. 8099th. Okay, there we go. 8099th. You have it here official. That's how you say it, guys and girls. <laughs> Yeah, I'm playing Lieutenant Plessy. 
what do we do here? All right, so I'm going to say that it's been a long, hard day in surgery. You've been in there for hours. You're tired. You're hungry. You're exhausted. You come out of the tent. You're still in your surgical whites. Take your mask off. Stumble out of the tent. Look around you. You're already going to be familiar with the unit. You know where everything's at. Ahead of you, you see your tent off in the distance. You see the mess tent up ahead. A handful of other tents around. Think about this. You're tired and you're tired and you're hungry. A couple main places, you know, are really looking appealing. Which way do you want to go? I think I need to hit the mess hall and grab a bite to eat. All right. So you go over, a few people nod at you on your way. You open the tent and it is full of Korean children. Okay. This is very unexpected. <laughs> You see, they're all sitting there, looking around. They look hungry. They look tired. There are a couple of Korean women standing in the background. Between the children and the mess line, you see a couple of MPs, and you see Captain Smith, who actually is one of your tent mates. He's what we call a sky pilot. He's a very religious person, but he's also kind of a dick. So he's standing there. He's kind of eyeing the children suspiciously and they're mostly on the the right side of the tent on the left side Mm -hmm. there are a few personnel sitting and eating and kind of wondering what's going on so what do you do i'll head up to captain smith captain um what's going on oh they brought in these orphans from sister rosa's orphanage down the road apparently one of our uh one of our tanks took a wrong turn and took out the building. Ah, damn. Now they need somewhere to stay and gotta keep a close eye on them, you know? They might take anything. They look fine right now, Cap. Uh, I'm gonna get a bite to eat. Alright, now be careful. Don't go sharing food with these these kids. They look hungry. Come on, Cap. A little... A little bit. You know we always have a little bit left over. All right. Sounds like you're trying to influence this jerk. So I am. <laughs> you uh, Influence has a few sub-levels. You can manipulate him. You can seduce him. Uh, or you could pull rank on him. Since he's higher rank than you, you're not really going to be able to do that. Uh, but you could try manipulating him or seducing him. Oh, I think I'm gonna. You know, we we do bunk together. I think I'm just gonna manipulate him right now. I'll, I'll start off with that one. All right, you'd roll plus luck, and of course you have plus one for that. Plus one, and, and here we go. I rolled an eleven. That is a twelve, <laughs> sir. Nice. I manipulate the hell out of that guy. Very nice. All right, he he looks a little a little shifty and says, "Well, all right, but you're in charge." And any problems are, you know, I'm going to talk to the CO about this. Okay. And he gestures to the MP to go on about his business. And he goes and walks over to the side and starts talking to one of these Korean women that's been watching over the orphans. And he's looking a little grumpy. You know, it seems like he's telling her to keep the kids in line. And he's trying to split his attention between them and... And you and her. Uh, forget this. I'm going to grab a tray. And I'm just going to load up with as much food as I can. And I'll share some with the kids. They can eat off my tray for now. All right. Well, they not quite sure uh, what's going on, but they see the food and, you know, they all, they all crowd around. They, they take a tray and take it back to the table. And it looks like you're going to need two or three more trays to take care of this. I'll just start a little line. I'll grab a roll, right? Stuff it into my mouth, leave that tray, go get another (laughs) tray. All right. There's a guy standing behind the chow line. Looks like a cook. And he's also giving you the eye. You're not sure why. I take my bite, kind of chew for a second as I'm loading up the next tray. Is there a problem? Said, yeah. When uh, I found this slip of paper on the ground... Outside says, uh, I owe you $20, Lieutenant Plessy. 
It's got your name on it. You know anything about this? Well, I do now. Somebody owes me 20 bucks. Yeah, or maybe you owe them 20 bucks, huh? Maybe uh, you'd like me to do you a favor by getting rid of this. Hold on, hold on. Let me check the handwriting on that one. All right, what do you think? Is that is that your handwriting? Do you owe somebody 20 bucks, or do they owe Okay, you? so there is a poker game. That's against regs, isn't it, or is it not? The gambling, that there's, that's fine. Oh, yeah. That's fine. Sure, yeah. Yeah, if I, if, you know, if I, that ends up going away, that wouldn't hurt anybody. I mean, 20 bucks is a lot of money. <laughs> I was really drunk. Yeah, what do you need to make that go away? Cook? All right, so <clears throat> you want to try and figure out what he wants. So I would say you're eyeballing him, trying to figure out what you think he wants or needs. So Okay, cool. A roll plus skill, which happens yeah. to be a plus one. Right. Oh my goodness, I have no idea who this man is. I have rolled Snake Eyes, man. In pure random, I went from an 11, the highest high almost, to a, to a Snake Eyes. Oh, oh. fail. All right, he says, uh, all right, well, you know, I, I don't want much. Just uh, just a, a small small bag, uh, a little, little white bag. Uh, maybe uh doesn't have to even be, uh, you know, not to be much. Maybe a little, a little bag of some... Uh, some uppers, pills, I don't know, like maybe 10 bucks worth. You could take them out of the hospital tent. Everybody would be all right. Well, uh, yeah, I'll see what I can do. I'll see what I can do, Cookie. All right. Are you, are you actually going to gonna do that, do you oh, think? Hell no. No, no, <laughs> no. That is the worst idea ever. I'm just not going to tell this guy when I've got a bunch of kids to feed the food that he could probably cut me off of. So I'll just... Yeah, I'm totally BSing him right now. All right. Yeah, I'm totally BSing him. I'll, I'll, I'll grab another tray and uh, head and, and finish feeding up the kids and then wolf down whatever this gravy-ish meat substance is. And uh, I probably need to grab some sleep. Uh, but I'm in charge here, right? I can't really skate on these kids until... Well, you can uh, go take a look over there at the... Korean woman, your your eyes are drawn that way because you hear Smith starting to get a little louder, and then all all of a sudden uh, this corporal comes in. You don't recognize him, but he walks over and he he takes one of the Korean women who's standing there next to the one that the captain's talking to. Figures she's probably in charge. Well, this corpsman takes the other one by the arm. And starts dragging her out. Um, yeah, I'm I'm getting my nose in that one. All right, I'll pull some rank if I need to. So what do you do, Corporal? What are you doing? Hey, it's, doesn't uh, doesn't concern you, you Captain. Oh, I'm sorry, Lieutenant. <laughs> He's got uh, bad vision. Yeah, uh, it does concern me. I'm in charge of making sure that these kids get fed, and she is their minder. The whole reason these kids are here is one of our tanks. Ran over their orphanage, so we at least got to take care of them until we can make sure that they're appropriately handled. So why are you taking her off? Because I really can't take care of this many kids. Hey, I own her. You got nothing to say about it. Um, yes, I do. Hey, I paid good money for her. She's my moose. You're you got nothing to say about it. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna step in. I'm gonna tell you that uh, a moose is the name for a Korean servant. Uh, on, okay. Sometimes the families would actually sell their daughters to be the servants of GIs, and she would follow him around. She takes care of his stuff. Okay. Cleans up everything after him. Good uh, to know. Good to know. It's not, that changes the, the, <laughs> the conversation a little bit. All right. It's not necessarily a, a, a sexual relationship. It mm -hmm. could be. It would depend on the GI. And this guy is not from your mash because your CEO probably would not tolerate it unless, you know, you you think he would. But um, there's always guys passing through on business or, you know, not just wounded, but coming into camp to get stuff. And this guy is not from your unit. OK, I'm pulling I'm pulling rank on him. Uh, she may be your moose when you're in your own unit, but you're here. And I outrank you, so you can wait. All right, so you're going to be pulling rank on him, so roll plus tough. 
All right, let's see how this goes. That's a six. Oh, <laughs> man. Oh, <laughs> uh, guy looks at you. He's like, "All right, you you may not rank me, but uh, you want to do something about it? Let's let's uh, let's do it." And he reaches down. And he grabs one of the trays that has the food on it, and he dumps it on the ground. And he takes it, pulling back. He's getting ready to swing this tray right at you. <laughs> wow. All of a sudden, you the loudspeaker comes over the camp, and your company clerk dashes in the tent, and he's like, Plussy, come on, we got incoming wounded again. Saved by the bell. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's it. So I think to go into like a surgical scene, you'd need some more players. So that's a, a nice cliffhanger to leave it on. I agree, man. Mark. Thank you so much for coming on Plus One Forward and sharing with me about MASH. This is really cool, man. Thank you so much. You're welcome. It's a lot of fun. Plus One Forward is a production of the Gauntlet community and Richard Rogers. You can find us on gauntlet-rpg.com or follow us on Twitter at gauntletrpg. The games mentioned on this show use the Apocalypse Engine, which is a creation of Vincent and McGay Baker. The music for Plus One Forward is from the Savage Oral Hotbed CD Gomi Daiko. The songs used are Gummy Daiko Metal Version and Process. You can find more amazing tunes by Savage Arl Hotbed on their website, savagearlhotbed.com. <laughs>